Hello and welcome to The Distance Podcast, brought to you by the Institute for Liberal Values. This is where we talk about how we can strive for a world in which freedom and reason are at the forefront of all human society. In this week's podcast, Elizabeth Spivak and Mike Burke discuss how fears of sexism may harm women. Hello and welcome to The Distance Podcast. Um, today we are looking at sexism, um, the role that sexism plays in how women think about themselves um, and how they think about their career prospects. Um, we're also going to talk about affirmation. So, you know, this idea that if somebody is experiencing some sort of bigotry, that it is important to affirm how they feel about that. So it is important to... <clears throat> acknowledge that they are suffering from this and and acknowledge that it's a bad thing potentially which makes some sense um at least from a naive point of view and maybe it makes some sense from a more discussed point of view we'll um we'll find out um so as usual please subscribe um comment share this article discuss it um we'd be really happy to hear from you but uh with that out of the way elizabeth would you care to introduce the article that yeah. frames the discussion yeah, so um, this article is called uh, How Information on Sexism May Increase Women's Perceptions of Being Excluded, Threaten Their Fundamental Needs, and Lower Career Motivation. And it's by uh, Frank, I guess it's Dulard and uh, colleagues. Um, so they did four studies uh, in this paper, and they expected that exposure to sexism uh, might threaten women's fundamental needs to belong and induce perceptions of social exclusion. And um, they also expected it to lower their achievement motivation um, and expectations for future success. Um, they did, um, they, like I said, they did four studies. Study one is purely correlational, um, a, a survey. Um, and then they used that same survey in studies two, three, and four with the addition of some uh, experimental manipulation. So it's the same survey in four studies, um, but with uh, slightly different methods each time. So the study one is purely uh, correlational. Um, so uh, I don't, I, I hesitate to even uh, bring this up before we've even talked to, to, to about the study. However, the very first line in the paper says, gender inequality remains a pervasive problem in society. Now, we don't know what gender inequality is. They don't define it, right? Um, they don't define, they don't, you know, they say it remains a problem. So they don't actually establish that it was a problem or it, the, it's just, you know, assumed. And I think if you, you know, uh, anybody who listens to Jordan, uh, Peterson, he, he would likely disagree with, with, with that statement. And not only that, but not only is there no definition and, you know, it's just presented, we can't question it. Right. It's just like, well, there it is. So, it's you know, you've got it. No, yeah. Um, but then the other, um, you know, again, you know, if you if you read some of some other literature, uh, the suggestion is that when you give people actually more freedom to choose, inequalities actually get larger, not smaller. So, you know, there's there's an argument to be made that women and men are choosing different kinds of career paths for reasons that make sense for them and that, you know, and, and so. Uh, uh, that it might not be sexism and inequality so much as as freedom of choice. <laughs> I think that you know sexism may be a variable. Um, sure, but, but, absolutely. But, um, I, I would argue that it's less of a variable now than it was in the past. But certainly, there are a few people, probably mostly older people, who would tend to regard women as being unsuitable for certain jobs that they may perfectly be suitable for. For example, management positions. Um, now, of course, I disagree that that's true but i'm just putting it out there that maybe there are some still people there are still some people who think like that um so i mean should we get into the gender inequality thing now um, um well we could we can say or we can say that we can go through the article and kind of you know talk about that at the end or however you want to do it i mean i just think that there are things there are some things to be said because i like when you i Let's talk about it later. And the reason why I want to talk okay. about it later, 
we could talk about it now, but the reason I think we should talk about it later is because one of the key findings of the article is, is that if you talk about sexism a lot, um, if you talk about the pervasiveness of sexism, that that actually has a negative impact upon women insofar as they um, would tend to downrate their, uh, their ability to get higher positions and that therefore impacts upon their motivations to try hard, which will in turn, they don't make this next jump, but I think it's a matter of course, which will in turn mean that less of them try, um, which then means that less well, of them get higher positions. Yeah. So let's uh, go through I mean, it. Yeah, I'm, I'm not actually convinced that that's even what they found. So um, okay. I know that's mm. what they say they found, but. That's what they say <laughs> they found. Um, so um, they're, uh, they're essentially, as you say, suggesting that, um, that, you know, uh, this sort of maybe microaggressions and, and those kinds of things are likely to induce this sense of exclusion and, uh, threaten their motivational, uh, and fundamental, uh, needs. Um, and, um, so they start out with a survey and, and the survey is with, um, is British female participants. So this is not a U.S. study. Um, and these are all people who are out of school. So 18 to 50 years old, at least a bachelor's degree. So these are not college students. And that's important because one of the studies is college students. And again, this is purely a survey. Um, so they used one of those, um, do the, is it Amazon Turk? No, prolific, uh, prolific. Um, and, uh, they asked people their agreement with certain statements, measuring the extent to which, uh, they think society is sexist. Um, and then they use, um, a couple of items about their, uh, a few items about threats to uh, basic needs. So the need for belonging, we talk a lot about the need for belonging on the podcast, the need for control, self-esteem, um, and then feelings just, this is basically just a positive and negative affect scale. So how, you know, how do you feel, you know, I feel angry. I feel sad. I feel, you know, the, that, and then, uh, open-ended questions, uh, as well as closed-ended questions about motivations for achievement. Um, so not a big surprise. They found that the results, there was a positive correlation between, um, uh, perceived sexism and perceived exclusion, threats to, uh, people's needs, the need to belong, that kind of thing, and, uh, negative feelings, and then a negative correlation between perceived sexism and uh, achievement motivation and achievement expectations. So that was sort of their base study. Again, same survey used in studies two, three, and four, but with slight differences, slight changes in the methodology. Um, so in study two, that this is the only study that has uh, university students. This is all female uh, participants. Actually, one person was excluded for answering that they were male. Um, so they, they signed up for a study. Uh, uh, and um, so these are 159 female participants at a uh, university, exactly the same survey. However, half of the, uh, no, a third of the participants beforehand were exposed to a fake study results from their own lab. It's like, oh, you know, the researchers, you know, here at this university, did a study and found evidence of sexism. Okay. So they had a little blurb that, that some of the participants read that showed that at their university, researchers had done a study to find sexism. Uh, a third of the participants read that same blurb about having done, having somebody doing research at their university, but they found that it was all changed to finding no evidence of sexism. And then a third of the participants answered the survey just this, exactly the same way that study one participants did. No, no d discussion of sexism, just answered the survey. Um, so there's a little more to talk about, I think, on, on this one. Um, they did find that um, the manipulation to introduce sexism, so the, the third of participants who read that the university researchers had found sec evidence of sexism, did um, similar kind of pattern. Those people did have 
um, uh, lower achievement motivation. Uh, they felt threats to their uh, their needs, um, and uh, they had more negative uh, feelings. They felt more excluded. The interesting thing, and you picked up on this also, was because you sent me a few notes that they did not find any significant difference between not hearing anything, so just filling out the survey cold, and hearing that the researchers at the university had found no evidence of sexism. So there's no significant difference between the control condition and a condition where participants heard that there was no sexism. So you picked up on that also, What it um, and, and you actually, uh, I think you made a little note of that. Um, so do you remember? Do, do you do you remember that you? Do I remember what on, I wrote in the yeah. notes? <laughs> well, I'll will start because I because you actually picked up on on the same thing. The idea this what made me think of and and you noted this too. So denying sexism was actually not harmful to these participants. So participants who read that there was a study at the university that did not find any evidence of sexism did not show those similar kinds of uh, low achievement motivation, uh, threats uh, to belonging and, and such. And so you had picked up on that too. Much on the consternation of the authors, by the way. They don't, they don't yes. seem to like that finding at they all. They do and, not like that. Um, and, and no, they don't, because in, in the discussion later on, they still kind of like go over that point, even though they contradict it in their yeah, own work. It's like work, maybe it was there to. and we just couldn't yeah, find yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And, and, yeah. and also I, I, I want to know what they think about what do they mean by denial, right? So I was like looking, I was like, is there an appendix? So I want to find these articles or these, you know, the, what your examples you're using for as denial, because I don't yeah. think there's an awful lot of denial of sexism out there, right? So I think that there are certainly well, people- the, the denial condition was that the researchers had at their university had done a study and found no evidence of but that's not denial. Well, no, but they're just calling it the denial uh, no, condition. I, I know, but this kind of like plays into a wider theme, if you like, when you would say that somebody like me and probably somebody like you, um, if a man was to be unpleasant to you, of which I'm sure there have been many, especially in recent years, mm -hmm. do did you conclude that sexism was the most likely cause of that behavior? No, but I don't think there's any evidence in this study that people, that they're asking people about that at all. They're asking people about their achievement motivation. So the people who answered this, the, the survey cold, um, you know, just seem to be answering like an attitudes and personality uh, survey. And then the people who read that uh, there was a study recently at the university who that didn't find any uh, evidence of sexism. Um, I don't I don't think that it was presented as, a, you know, typically when you do a study like this, a lot of times you tell people that they're participating, that we've, oh, we've collapsed a couple of, of projects together here in order to it, to be more convenient to participants. So you're going to read uh, some things and answer, you know, they answered some questions about that little research study. Okay. So pretending like that's what it was. And then you're going to answer this attitudes and personality uh, kind of scale and answer some questions about your, your life experiences. So I don't think people were asked about their denial but, or no, their... No, no, maybe they weren't. But I mean, this kind of like highlights a disconnect. And we've, we've had this issue before, right? Not with this article, but with another article where there is a clear disconnect in what is being argued in how the, insofar as how the argument is being, how the, not the argument, how the paper is being framed um, in the introduction section and in the discussion section. So, you know, for example, here, um, when they're talking about denials and, pr you know, presumably they, if they're talking about this here, then presumably they're talking about something that they are then going to go and do in the paper. So participants' reactions to denials of sexism um, is this in the introduction? Yeah, hang on. I mean, I'm trying to find. Okay. No, there's there's something even cleaner than this. Uh, here we go. Uh, 
Okay, exposure to information that doesn't deny sexism was a relevant comparison because this is denial, i.e. the idea that sexism is a thing of the past, that it is no longer relevant in today's society, is an idea that is directly opposed by information about the prevalence of sexism. So that's just a blank assertion. So that would seem yeah, to, so that that would seem an, to is imply... Is that an introduction, though? That's in the... Um, that's actually in the method. Oh, okay. Of of this of set of study two. Um, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm just because I've got this. I haven't got it in front of me in a piece of paper, so it's difficult yeah. for me to manipulate. Yeah. Um, three point one. Yeah, three point one. Um, three point one method. Participants and design. Yeah. Participants read uh, respectively that the study showed that men and women have une unequal or equal chances of achievement. That men and women that discriminated discrimination against women is oh, no, no, or hang is on. no longer. Hang on, this might be messed up by the formatting. It might not actually be in the because um, this is I put got open this in Google Documents and it's all over the place. Oh. Um, yeah. So this is actually the yeah, I I find it now. It's actually before it's be, it's their justification for study two. So right. what they're so saying is alternatively, however, denials of sexism may not affect women negatively. So, and in fact, that's what they found. They found that it did not affect them. No, but the, the, no, the, the assertion is even stronger than this, right? So they say, um, the idea that sexism is the thing of the past, that it is no longer relevant in today's society is an idea that is directly opposed by information about the prevalence of sexism. So that's like a cold assertion. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, they definitely are. I mean, they definitely have. A, this isn't here's the thing, you know, in all these journals that want you want you to declare your, your, declare biases. your biases and stuff. They're not going to declare that, you know, that. Uh, and, and, and so, that so, so the point the point that I wanted to make is that, like, when you look at the literature, what they what they seem to offer up when they're saying that there's no evidence of sexism within this context, that does not constitute a denial from my perspective or yours, or I, we would argue right. probably any reasonable perspective. But because they framed it in the introduction as being such, they're saying, you know, they're talking about denial and then they go on to use this as essentially as an example of denial. They're saying that if you say that there's no evidence of sexism in a roundabout way, then that itself constitutes denial. That that's how they they frame the right. argument. That's how they've right. made it up. And, and look, by the way, it's not necessarily even that I disagree with that. Like like I I don't think that sexism is a thing of the past. I don't think that misogyny is a thing of the past. I think that they exist in society, probably at all layers of society. But it would depend upon which layer you're looking at the extent to which that sexism exists and the extent to which it plays out. So for example, um, and I don't know, I'm just, you know, this is just conjecture. I, I would argue that sexism in more traditional working class communities, wherein life more closely resembles life in the early 20th century than it does the kind of life that middle-class affluent people live today. I would think that sexism was more prevalent in those kind of societies than it would be in a psychology department in the liberal arts university for example well that's a flaw that's one of the flaws well first of all i just i do want to say that even though they do have that bias that is not how they framed their study materials that mm. it was a denial of sexism yeah but um but this that is a flaw in study two um which is that they they have you know they they the participants are college students and for the most part college students um you know sort of they're not really experiencing much sexism while they're on campus and, and stuff. I mean, it, you know, uh, I would say that it's the least, one of the least sexist environments that they're, that they have spent time in, um, you know, as you're going through school, it, it's, you know, in fact, in many ways, women are, um, are, it's advantageous at, you know, education is, is a, you know, they get called on more often. Now they tend to, to perform better. They're perform they're, they're the majority at universities. Um, and they're, they, they tend so, to get better grades. Yeah. So. so this is, this is weird, isn't it? Right. I mean, this is kind of yeah. one of the weird kind of myths that still permeates through academia, that academia remains a sexist institution. But if you look at it from a consequentialist point of view, there are more women, women seem to do better. And yet, even in the meantime, there are job posts, certainly in Japan, I imagine in America too, that say female candidate preferred all over them. 
Okay, so from a consequentialist point of view, if we're going to look at sexism in terms of the inequalities that we perceive, right? So, so one way of looking at sexism, and it, it, it doesn't mean that I necessarily follow this argument, right? So you can get inequalities completely independent of bigotry. You know, so you, like I would, like for example, if we're looking at, I, I think this, you, you can correct me here, I think the study was done with rhesus monkeys and um, toy choices, you know, where the, the, the male infant monkeys would prefer sticks and objects like that, whereas the females would prefer, prefer dolls. And I think it's hard to make the case that that comes from some socially constructed sexism, <laughs> right? Um, so it's a it's an inequality that is happening. So the consequences are showing an inequality, but it doesn't follow that the intention is oppressive or nasty. In fact, you know, you could have an inequality that was actually a good thing, like the division of well, labor. Well, the exactly. division of that's, labor, right? That's the thing. Like, you know, if I mean, if if we're going to do this, if if we want equality of outcome then that just means we what we randomly assign people to be you know what nba basketball players right so yeah. it's like oh you got to have half the half of them have to be women doesn't and half of them doesn't matter how tall you are you know you're just you just you know you're going to be an nba bas you're going to be a football player you're going to be a bricklayer you're going to be a teacher and it's just like we want every, everybody has to but, be it, it all has to be equal i mean you know it it doesn't make sense ridiculous. it, it, yeah. it can, you know everybody says look one of the great things that happened in human history was the division of labor you know we started to realize that different people were good at different things and that's a huge strength because it means that you can focus on what you're actually able to do at a high level and you don't have to commit time trying to get good at tasks that you're not suited to um so yeah unequal outcomes are actually desirable now obviously they're not desirable in terms of pay and things like that but you know that's a different question you know but but certainly unequal outcomes are, are usually not the creation of bigotry. So when I'm making this argument, I'm kind of doing it with a, a tongue in my cheek, my fingers crossed. Um, but the point is, is amazingly within academia, this, this argument is, I wouldn't even say made, is held to with almost religious further, that further, that if you see unequal outcome between genders, that it must be bigotry, right? Now, right. I, I'm not saying that bigotry isn't a factor um you know again i mean it, there would need to be research done into how much that is a factor but but i would i'd be surprised if it wasn't a factor at least some of the time um although that said as you allude to it would be less of a factor for example in a modern liberal arts college than it would be a liberal arts college 60 years ago or a working class community you know um so so anyway let's just like go with this consequentialist argument because they do, because they hold to it. But they don't even hold to it consistently, right? So they hold to it, for example, when it seemed, seemed, to, dis when it seemed to disadvantage women or, or ethnic minorities or gay people and so on and so forth, right? But if you really look at the modern academy, again, purely in terms of consequence, then the consequences would have to be negative towards men more than yes. women. Yes. Right? Men don't do as well. Right. They represent They're not a smaller... attending college in the same, at the same uh, percentage and when they do attend they don't finish as, right they drop out at a higher rate they, drop out. Yeah. Um, yeah. they are making up in, and yet even in spite of all of that information which again if you are going to go down this consequentialist way of thinking in which if you see inequalities then the answer must be bigotry if you're being consistent with that then you would have to say that the system is bigoted against men right no no, no i don't think that it is by the way um, I, I think that there are certain female traits, certain traits that are more common amongst female than they are amongst men. And academia suits that. That would be my argument, right? But I, I think there probably is a bit of sexism against men creeping in there. Yeah. And, why, uh, yeah. is it that, and why is it that we're correcting, well, having been made the victim of it, right? Having been just dismissed as being a cis white male, so it's racist mm -hmm. and sexist, but you know. Um, but you know, even in spite of that, even in spite of all of these consequences and, and in spite of the fact that if the, the, this consequentialist view, kind of Kendi like view of inequality were to be held consistently, then we would say, okay, well, we need more men. We need to do something to correct for the disadvantage that, that, that men face. And yet we still see today in 2023 advertisements for faculty positions that say female candidate preferred as if the opposite was happening to yeah. what all the data tells us is happening. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, so the so the only condition in which participants these are again college women, um, you know, so when they're told explicitly told before they complete a survey that there is, uh, you know, that that a researcher at their university found evidence of sexism then they respond the way that people, um, you know, responded in, in the first survey, the, uh, the adults who were in the workforce who had already gotten a degree. Um, so, you know, that, that there was, um, you know, somewhat less um, achievement, motivation, and expectations, and um, somewhat more perceived exclusion and threat to the, uh, the needs. So in study three, and one of the things, uh, you know, uh, I, I want to mention here, it is when when people write up their research studies for public or research, like a, a series of studies for publication, um, the tendency to, is to assume that they were done in the order that they're presented in the paper. And that isn't always necessarily true. People might present them in, in a different order, but um, uh, so in study three, um, participants, uh, this is back to uh, adult participants who were between, uh, who had already had finished their degree. So they're using the prolific participants again. Um, and so in this study, they just have the two conditions. They have um, uh, a, a, an exposure to sexism information and then um, no, just the plain survey again. So two conditions. They're going to expose people to information about sexism, or they're just going to fill out the survey the same way the control condition in, in study uh, two and the same survey that people filled out in study one with no manipulation. So in this case, the information about sexism came in the form of actual news uh, articles. The... Um, Mostly just the head, I mean, they only showed it for 30 seconds. So the people weren't expected to read the article or anything like that. But there was a, um, a headline that uh, implied uh, that, you know, sexism and, um, a, you know, a paragraph or so. But again, 30 seconds. So people weren't necessarily reading these articles, but it, these headlines were about the prevalence of sexism in society. They also asked people uh, questions. Uh, at the end of the surveys, everyone answered these questions about how often, on a scale from one to seven, from never to very often, how often have you personally encountered um, a, a situation where you were treated in a sexist way? How often have you personally encountered a situation where you felt discriminated against because of your gender? Now, this is a one through seven. Uh, it's pretty ambiguous. And we do this a lot in psychology where we just like cross our fingers that people are going to understand what we mean. But what does that mean? Does that mean like, you know, does that mean in, in your family? Does that mean at work? It was totally not clear um, at all. I think, you know, in the last five years, in your lifetime, in the last six months, it, you know, not, not clear at all. Um, but regardless, um, what did they find? They found what's called a main effect for condition and for um, having previous experience of sexism. So what does that mean? That means that those two variables predicted the same things that we've been talking about. Each variable on its own predicted uh, low achievement expectations, um, you know, negative feelings, uh, threats to needs, um, each one. So if people said that they had experienced sexism, um, then they tended to have lower achievement expectations, report threats to needs, and this that kind of thing. If people saw the news articles, they did the same. Okay, so only those people who did not see news articles and who said they had never experienced sexism. Uh, those are the only people who did not, who reported, you know, no difference in um, experience, in uh, achievement, motivation and expectations. So um, I don't think we really need to talk any more about that until we talk about study four, because study four did the same thing, only here's what they did. They put those those questions about whether you had experienced 
sexism, they put those at the beginning of the survey. So now essentially there is no one who is answering the standard survey that they've used from study one. There's no one who's answering the survey who is not getting getting primed up basically by thinking about sexism. So either you're seeing those news articles or you're getting explicitly asked how often, not have you, yes, no, but how, how often, often, how often have you, okay? So everybody in study four gets exposed to getting told there's sexism in some manner, shape or form, they're getting told that. And they basically found no, no statistically significant differences between the groups. So, um, so, so their, their hypothesis, you know, um, uh, their hypothesized differences uh, failed to reach uh, significance in, in study four. Um, so this is something, by the way, this is something that we call uh, uh, order effects. So um, can, we can also, uh, so that's when the order of the questions in your uh, study affects the outcome of the study. So that is important. It might seem like a throwaway, but it's important because if we think about how important then it would be to know, are people genuinely being affected by sexism or by thinking about sexism? then you need to consider the possibility that your study design is actually biasing the results, right? Right. So, so if study four chronologically actually took place the first, then you might very well be influencing stu studies two, three, studies one, two, yeah. and three, if they're That's in a different order. That's why I mentioned it. It is I, I possible. I got that was where you were going. Yeah. I got that was where it you were possible. going. It is possible. Now, I mean, I don't, I, you know, uh, I'm not saying that they did that, but it is possible that they did a study and didn't find anything and said, oh, how about we do, you know, you, you don't know. And, and it's, you know, um, this is also um, familiar to people. People might have heard of something called stereotype threat. Mm -hmm. And that we could actually relate this to stereotype threat right now. So that's the idea that um, some of the examples people have heard of. If you're filling out, say, standardized tests, um, you know, to entrance exams or whatever, and they ask demographics first, then it tends to um, uh, affect uh, subsequent performance. So, for example, if um, women are taking the math subsection, say, of a standardized test, um, and they are asked about their gender before completing the math test, they will tend to do a little bit less well. If um, you ask about race, um, and uh, uh, people of Asian descent who tend to be thought of as doing better in say math, they tend to do in fact a little bit better. And you can actually manipulate that in other ways. You don't have to ask the question. You can seat people next to one another so that race or gender is primed up. Um, I read a cute little study one time where they had a woman, had women come in and they took, the, they took their math tests all by themselves in a cube, so in a, in a closed cubicle OK, and the women um, were instructed to uh, wear a bathing suit underneath the, their clothing. And when they took so and they had to they were supposed to take the uh, test in their bathing suit and they did worse, even though they were all by themselves and no one ever saw them in their bathing suit. <laughs> they did worse in their bathing suit, you know, because they're thinking about, you know, uh, uh, you know, being women. And by the way, the effect works the opposite with men. Men who are taking the verbal part of a standardized test tend to do worse when they're reminded of their gender because men tend to, to there's this expectation that men are going to do less well on, say, you know, on, on paragraph writing and, you know, you know, verbal skills. So, you know, the effect, so this could be partly stereotype threat too. Yeah. I mean, and do you know about the research into, um, uh, placebo. Oh, sure. Yes. So, you know, the, the red pill will create one effect, the blue oh, pill sure. will create another effect. Um, uh, you know, the more invasive the placebo is, the more effective it's reported at being. So, if, you know, if you get an injection, the actual substance is the same, but the, the, right. the method of delivery is, is really important. 
Um, so the point being is that there are all lots, you know, and, and if you've ever watched, um, you know, Darren Brown, do you know him? Mm -mm. Um, go on Netflix, watch him. He's, he's really worth watching. He's a, a magician, um, but he doesn't do cards and things like that. He's all about, you know, priming people with psychological cues in order to believe things and it'll get them to believe that they've been tied up by a voodoo doll and then they can't move and the rest of it. It's, it's really, really interesting and really great. But what it shows is that how you can use these subtle and the reason why it's a magic show and you're gasping and going, wow, is these cues are subtle to the point of being imperceptible to create really powerful and dramatic results. And so if it's happening with Darren Brown on this TV show, you can imagine that it's happening in all kinds of ways, ways in society. Um, otherwise, what he's doing wouldn't be effective. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, what. At the very least, in regards to the, the study order question, you know, obviously you're, you're right insofar as we don't know. Well, we know that study four may very well have primed them. Um, we don't know that study four came last. But at the very least, it's a weakness, them not telling us the order in which the studies took place. Right. Yeah. I mean, we, we presume. Because if it, because if it did come they... last. If it did come last, then they should say so, because that answers a big question. And you would have thought that as psychologists that are publishing in a peer-reviewed paper, they'd know about this, right? Well, they, they yeah, they, they well, want us to believe that, that they were presented in the order in which they did, you know, did, did the work. And they may have, but it, it was, I did think it was, you know, worth bringing up. Raise so. an eyebrow. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's possible. Um, so, anyway, um, I... Well, so I, I made, and, and I'm sure you made also the immediate uh, connection to uh, racism in, yes. in society, right? And the, uh, and just this idea of, you know, uh, microaggressions and, you know, being alert and, and sort of reminding, are we, you know, are we harm like, they're saying like, oh, the denial of sexism is is harmful. Well, are we actually harming people by constantly saying, you know, there's sexism, 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 or racism, racism, racism? Um, so, you know, are we so, well, constantly priming people? Well, up? let's well, well let's 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 unpack that a little bit, right? Um, so, you know, the classics. This is often called a Kafka trap, right? So, um, the idea that, okay, so for example, if you let, let's start from the beginning so if you were to come up to me and said a man you know you encountered a man in a restaurant somewhere maybe you're at a dinner party or something like that and the man had constantly talked about gender roles in which you know the real women are should be at home and cooking and motherly and nurturing and you know the extent to which you depart from those roles um is the extent to which you are maladaptive or you are bad as a woman, if you were to tell me that you had experienced that, I would believe you without questioning, right? Yeah. You know, I mean, maybe you're being crazy and you're yeah, inventing it's, stuff. But it's but, it's you know. not out of the realm of possibility. No, I, I, I think right. that probably you had experienced that. You probably have experienced that maybe a lot more when you were younger than you would now. Would that be fair? Yeah, I mean, I started working in the, you know, in industry in the late 80s. And of course, you know, I got, I don't, I don't, I say chased around the desk. Uh, that's an exaggeration, but definitely it, there was, you know, the, you get the idea. There was definitely yeah. some, some sexism and, and, you know, um, and, and, and the like. <laughs> well, I mean, but that, but, but again, that might not even be the same either. Right. So it might be possible if you're, um, I don't know, a very amorous young chap, running around chasing women, it doesn't necessarily mean that you think any less of the women in terms of their intellectual ability, right? Or, or oh, even that you right, hate them. Right, yeah. um, so so that, that's often confused with sexism too, right? So it might be that like some chap is very impressed with a woman and wants to date her. He might want to date her. One of the reasons he might want to date her is because he thinks that she's amazingly bright and is incredibly impressed by her as an individual, as well as how beautiful she may be, right? So, I mean, that's often confused as well. So, you know, when we talk about sexism and misogyny, there's so it's just so ambiguous right mm -hmm. the two are conflated with each other and they're not the same thing so for example you might hate women you know a lot of like for example a lot of these incel characters that you would see with their own weird web forums and stuff they they hate women but they don't necessarily think that women are any lesser in terms of their intellectual ability in for fact example, they men. might 
think quite the opposite right and that right. might be a reason for them hating them right. um so you know you can be a misogynist and not be a sexist right. or equally <laughs> you could be a sexist in you know in so far as you think that women should be the nurturing type at home and you don't believe that they should be in other roles or because they are somehow less capable of other roles but not be a misogynist and still you could idolize your mummy and, and, and your right. wife and your daughters and, and think that they're wonderful. So you're sexist insofar as you think that they lack certain capabilities, but it doesn't mean that you hate them. Um, right. So, you know, the, all of these kinds of things are all blurred in together as if they were the same thing and, and they're not. And, and, and further, when we're talking about sexism, you know, or misogyny or whatever or on an individual level, it doesn't follow from you experiencing sexism on an individual level that you can extrapolate reliably and say that therefore this is systemic and happening throughout society. Um, so, you know, when we talk about something like affirmation, um, if you were to tell me that you experienced something like that, you were chased around the desk, for example, getting the metaphor, of course, um, yes. then of course I'd say, oh yeah, and that's not great. You know, um, but then it wouldn't follow that from you being chased around the desk in, I don't know, 1995, that therefore we can conclude in 2023 that sexism is systemic. And we have to be clear in this article what they're talking about. They're not talking about sexism on the individual level like we just were, although they might be kind of trying to blur it. Um, they are talking about this very systemic thing. And then they go on to kind of in, in, imply the same about race as well when they talk about when they raise a critique of, you know, so-called colorblind racism, which actually is a straw man, but we can get into that in a second. Um, so the idea is what they're, they're saying is that what they seem to be saying is that denial of systemic sexism is dangerous. That's what they seem to be asserting in the introduction. And that seems to be, and the, the data seems to contradict them. Not only does the data seem to contradict them on that, the data seems to say the opposite is true. That if you affirm um, systemic sexism, that you actually can do harm to women in right. terms of their career prospects. And then they, they, they say some okay stuff in the discussion, they go to balance it and they say, well, look, um, systemic sexism is a thing and people need to be aware of biases and so on and so forth. Well, yeah, they do. What are they? You know, right. if you want to discuss, you know, what, what are they? So if you want what? to discuss sexism, I don't doubt that it's real. Where? By whom? When? Yeah. Is it more in this institution than this institution? Let's fucking find out. Let's discover. <laughs> Let's discuss. But then it seems to imply that any, dis because this is what's happening out there, right, in the Twitter sphere. Um, and and, and it, it is mirrored in the kind of language of this article, right? This kind of dumbed down, woolly thinking. It's like sexism, like any other force in society, like racism, for example, is complex well, where does it exist how does it exist what are the consequences are the consequences benign they might be um are the consequences sometimes positive to women for example some women probably get ahead because they're very attractive you know that might be an advantage um let's discuss this well, instead of looking yeah. at it, this monolithic thing that that, that, that that you know you just there's just these vague statements that aren't even aren't even thought about. So it's like, well, what are so, you talking about? And the implication seems to be, just the last point, the implication seems to be that denial, what they seem to mean by denial, is having a nuanced discussion. That's what, they, that's what I read from it. Yeah. Well, I yeah, I, again, again, I think you're right, that the way that they presented study to was oh we're going now they're not their not their actual materials but the way that they introduced study two was that this you know that denial of sexism but their materials really didn't deny sexism what their materials showed that, that there was a lack of, of of a sexist finding but I want to take this so I'm going to take this like a little bit a little bit into like further uh, like a field okay. <laughs> if you will. So here's something that I was thinking about was if if we go with the if we go with them that just like sexism is rampant and you know we again we could go with racism or whatever that it's systemic and and we shouldn't even you know talk about some of like the you know the nuances of it or the the complexities of it or whatever then then here's here's what here's some things that I wrote down just like scribbled down was you know um so why why would companies hire any men? So if women are consistently, uh, you know, 
treated more if, if they're just expected to do you know whatever they're paid they're paid less why would companies ever hire men there would be no incentive to hire men because we can pay mm -hmm. women less and they'll just suck it up and they might be miserable but they'll just do it and they won't have any achievement motivation which means that they're not going to be coming to me and saying when am i going to get a raise and when am i going to get promoted they'll just do their job so companies wouldn't hire men so the, in fact sexism would actually work you know that would 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 you know uh encourage them you know to just hire women who would just you know they'll just do their bidding and and they might be miserable but they'll they'll just uh they won't have the achievement motivation um here's another question that i wrote down uh why would anyone transition to being a woman if being a woman right. is bad, is is you know it's like it's it's just another you know uh, why would any parent allow a male child to transition to be a woman? Because again, you know, they're just going to set up their kid for, you know, um, and then why wouldn't we just declare all of our children males to benefit, you know, if, the, if it's going to be such a great, and if, and if you are a newly transitioned to male, why would you ever want to admit that you had transitioned because again you would be giving up the power that supposedly comes with all of this male privilege so the, to me these are i mean these are far out questions i recognize no, them no. Extreme, the, but some of them some of them are not some of them <laughs> we can have actually have present day examples for right um china china is an extremely sexist society right um Probably it went through a liberalization period un under Hu Jintao, which may be kind of continued for a bit under Xi Jinping, but that's all been reversed now. Um, but even in its most liberal period, it was still a hugely sexist society. For a long time, um, up until actually very recently, having, until they realized that their demographics are the worst in the world right. by far. Oops. Uh, oops. <laughs> um, social engineering, don't do it. Um, anyway, um, so, you know, one child policy and an extremely sexist society, guess which sex they preferred? Men. Mm -hmm. And so now we have a society that has How's the worst that demographic. Out for you? Well, they have the, even, even if we split it 50 50, if we imagine it was 50 50, they would still have the worst <laughs> demographics by far in the world. But now they've got loads of blokes and very, very few women. Um, so, so, you know, the, in a, this is, it's actually happened, you know, in a society in which male being male, was overwhelmingly favored they did they they aborted lots and lots of female babies and chose to have male ones and created all kinds of a disaster but that happened and it happened because all of the social factors within that society overwhelmingly favored males and so they selected for males so if those pressures were the same in america as a lot of the gender ideologues would tend to suggest then we surely would be in a similar position no in fact would be in a worse position because there would be no limitation on babies, right? So mm, in China, you right. can only have one kid, but right, in the West, right. you can have as many as you like. So we would just be having families of eight blokes. Right. You know, if it was this kind of cold, rational way of thinking, you know, yeah. but, but these, these arguments never stand up to much, do they? No, no. What's going on there? They never stand up to much. Well, and yet we're thing. expected to take them on faith by smart well, people. I'm going to, but I'm going to give, I'm going to give people credit because, because look, um, you know, we've done the same thing, you know, in, in the podcast and, and, um, and, it, I, and of course I can't remember when I've made this mistake, although I sure I have, but I can definitely remember when you've made this mistake, but no, like <laughs> I'm just teasing, but we, we, um, we use, we do lean on our own personal experience, that sort of N of one, you know, oh, I'm not like that, or I see it this way. And so we are criticizing the authors for having, you know, having a, you know, a perspective or a, a, a bias, if you will. But there's simply no such thing as unbiased. There just really isn't. And, and, um, and at least at least they showed their colors and you know and we can and we can see it here um so i i don't want to be i don't i don't want to be overly critical of the of of their 
essentially there's, I, I don't like the way they presented sexism. I don't like it. Um, but I do appreciate that, you know, they didn't find, they didn't exactly find what they were after and, and they, you know, admitted it. They tried to explain it away, but they admitted that they didn't find exactly what they were after. I'm, I'm not going to be as charitable as you, right? Um, so I, first of all, I would agree there is no person that does not have biases. However, it does not follow from statement one, that there is no person that has biases. Two, that it is impossible to mitigate one's biases. So it is impossible to eliminate one's biases, but it is eminently possible to mitigate one's biases. And the easiest place um, for one to mitigate one's biases is in the subject area one knows the most about, because yes, that's where you put they, your concentration. I agree. In. They did they not are psychologists. Try, they were not motivated to mitigate their biases. They were not motivated to do that. And that is a product of current, the current social and um, so, sociopolitical environment. That really is, is a product of that. I mean, we, we are seeing more, I mean, of the articles that we read, we see this quite a bit you know, that, that there's simply when, when they have this kind of motivation, they are, you know, they, sh they just state it and they're proud of it and, and they're getting, you know, getting published because of it and probably. Yeah. Yeah. So what would be regarded from an analytic point of view as an, an intellectual weakness, which is showcasing your bias um, but also reaching tenuously trying to reach conclusions in your discussion section that are contradicted by the data you present. It is present. a very long discussion. It is a very, a very, very long discussion. And there's a reason for that, right? Because yeah. they're trying to do some mental gymnastics to try and say, systemic sexism. Okay, fine. If you want to get into that, what is it? Tell me yeah. what it is. Yeah. Um, you know, you can imagine what Lee, you know, Lee Justin would do with this. Yeah. I mean, he would, you know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be pretty. Um, and so, yeah, but the, 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 and the really sad thing is, is that the paper, the findings in the paper are actually quite useful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, even though they tried to smudge it over and hide what they actually found, which is, which is really sad. Why would they do that? I would love to see a similar, a similar paper on on race on race yeah i mean I, I i can anecdotally go with that a little bit because i think it's worth it and i think that this should be the null hypothesis i think the null hypothesis should be that ginning up you know these exaggerated claims of systemic racism which again isn't to say that systemic racism isn't a thing but if we want to define that again we have to have a comfortable nuanced discussion and a com and, a, and a nuanced discussion is often dismissed as denial an example of racism by the likes of d'angelo in the same way that this paper argues that, you know, if you're going to deny racism, which for them in the paper was saying that there's no evidence for racism within this context, that's what they seem to imply is a denial of sexism, that that therefore is an example of sexism. N no, that can't, you know, that eliminates the possibility of, of having a proper discussion. Um, that certainly isn't, you know, an example of sexism or racism. But, you know, if we're going to, if we're going to go down this direction, you know, I would I would argue that exaggerated claims of racism, if people believe them, why would you bother trying? If you believe that America is so woefully sexist and you're a woman or homophobic and you're gay or racist and you're black. You know, you might think, uh, you know, the chances of me getting ahead are so small that why why should I bother? Well, and I don't I and I, I think, too, that we shouldn't conflate believing it with simply being exposed to it because we don't know whether these people believed it or so not I have a, right I, you know, that simply simply being exposed to it was enough that's right. the amazing thing to me right so that if we're seeing it in the, so we just see headlines in the newspaper and now and again we don't know whether this effect lasts either right this could just Good be point. transitory but that wouldn't, I mean, so what, right? So, so maybe you read, you know, you, you're sitting waiting for your, your uh, interview, right? And you're like reading the, you know, there's a, an article, Newsweek, you know, magazine in the, in the like waiting area or whatever. And it says, you know, gender, you know, 
uh, sexism, you know, or it says racism or whatever. And then you, you know, it's like, then you go into your, you know, your interview, even if it's transitory, even if you don't believe it, you know, maybe just exposure to it is, is enough, right? That's well, the, yeah. what about if you go into the interview and the, you know, and you're black and the first thing the employer talks about is the DEI, right? <laughs> Diversity and stuff. Say, oh, black people That's are, right. are and really, it, and we want to be clear to be that we're positive thing. Right. 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 And that we and, have and, this DEI and, office and stuff. And so maybe it's not such a positive. And, and yeah. maybe most of the time it's intended to be positive, but you know, unintended oh, yeah. consequences oh, yeah. happen. It would absolutely, yeah, it would I mean, absolutely be pr presented as positive. But now, like you say, you've you've essentially told someone, "I'm aware, and you should be aware that you know that there's racism, and we're trying to do something about it." You know, but it's you know, it's it's here, it's in the air. You know. So, so, so what they what they do on the first hand is they give a very very dubious example of sexism. And then they say that questioning this and their example of questioning it was simply saying that there was no evidence of sexism within this organization um, is denial, is sexism. Um, and then they find that amplifying fears of sexism um, causes negative effects. And then in the next stage, when we get into the article, the, towards the end of the discussion, they reject the liberal solution to this. So the liberal solution to racism um, and they don't talk about specifically the liberal solution to sexism, but it's the same thing, so I can do it easily, um, would be to argue that we should, while on the one hand, we can acknowledge that there may be in general differences between men and women, you know, that women tend to be more interested in some things and men tend to be interested in others, that, you know, there are lots of women who become engineers and there's nothing wrong with that because we see people as individuals, not according to the category that they belong to. And it doesn't mean that we don't see that they're women. It means that we don't judge them because of their gender. Similarly, when it comes to black people. So they say that, you know, claim colorblind anti-racism is a bad thing. What are you talking about? And presumably they would argue something like colorblind racism means you don't acknowledge somebody as black. No, that's not what it means. It means that I don't judge them on the basis of their skin color. It doesn't mean that I don't see their skin color. It's metaphorical, not literal. I mean, I'm not saying that there aren't some idiots who would argue that it was literal and say, I don't see color. Of course you see color, but it means you don't judge somebody on, the, on that basis. And these were arguments that worked. And were they 100% effective? Did they get rid of all biases? Of course not, because we've already said that they're impossible to eliminate, but it does not follow that because they're impossible to eliminate, they aren't possible to mitigate or yeah, even have well within control. So they rule out the liberal solution. It really does seem like, you know, the left, especially. Um, the authoritarian left, because we're still the, left, yes, right? The authoritarian, the, yeah, the the authority, the authoritarian left seems to really be in the business of just of of making smaller and smaller and smaller groups of people, right? So more and more and more little groups of people that are go that are defining themselves in that this their their little you know intersectional way, and I cannot figure out how that's liberal. I cannot figure out how it is liberal to, it to isn't. divide and then divide that division and then divide that division and then divide that division and how we're ever going to come together in any kind of, of, of way, um, you know, to fight the authoritarian, to I fight, but to the authoritarian right, you know, which most, which liberals are not in favor of either. So we have, you know, I, and so, I can't figure out how all these little teeny tiny divisions of things is is a, is any kind of of an improvement or any kind of uh, removal of of isms. And the authoritarian right is conciliatory now. By the way, the authoritarian right isn't by and large homophobic. It isn't by and large sexist, and it isn't by and large racist either. You know, there are black members of far right mm -hmm. movements now, which was something that in the 60s and 70s, 80s, even 90s, you would never right. see. Um, now you're seeing black, you're seeing gay, famous gay right wing commentators, Milo Yiannopoulos, who claims not to be gay now, but you know, you get yeah, the point. He was, well, I don't believe him, but, but yeah. he was a right wing provocateur for a long time right. while op being openly gay. So the point stands. Um, so you've got an incredibly conciliatory right wing um, movement 
that is, as we've identified in previous podcasts, dangerously creating this kind of outgroup of them, which is also kind of very broad and open. But they do seem to be bigger tent. Oh, they are. Yeah, they're well, you know? broad church. Yeah. yeah, they're much bigger yeah. tent. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so you'd have to say that, you know, okay, the, the moment the kind of the authoritarian leftists are at a clear advantage because they have um, control over the institutions uh, or much more control over the institutions. The right doesn't have any control in universities or you know, to the extent that people like us are called right wing, which is just crazy. Um, right. Yeah. right. Um, the right doesn't seem to have control over any academic institutions. Um, you know, maybe you might say the Hoover Institute, but that would seem to be a very reasonable right wing kind of. Well, I think, yeah, I think there's one or two, you know, private institutions, you know, in each state, maybe even, you know, small it, private institutions. But, but nothing in comparison. No. No. But, but even so, when you've got a broad church movement versus a movement, uh, you know, a broad church movement that seems to emphasize a shared humanity um, versus a movement that is divisive to the extent that it is dividing itself even within its own allegiance, um, then you'd have to say any control that they have over any institutions would likely be temporary. I mean, this kind of stuff is doomed to failure, isn't it? I, I, and I'm scared about yeah. what replaces it. I am too. I am too. I'm terrified. Um, yeah. you know, we have to seeing... end this on a. We have to end this on a positive note, though, so we can't. Well, I mean, the positive. The positive note would be to. T <laughs> is there any way we can kind of like bring people into this yeah. kind of more uncertain, unsure? No, probably not. Right, because people. Because it's really hard to be uncertain and unsure and full of doubt. What is it Bertrand Russell once said? You know, Bertrand Russell, the famous philosopher, mm -hmm. um, he argued that one of the saddest facts of the world, and I'm paraphrasing rather than quoting, is that the world is full of cocksure, dumb people, whereas the intelligent are insecure and full of doubt. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I mean, let's just hope that we can rein the other side in. Because we've been really yeah. successful in reining the Wokies in. Uh, haven't we? Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> How's that working out for us? <laughs> and on that delightful note, thank you very much. Um, again, please uh, leave a comment if you've got any ideas on how to rein the Wokies in or the emerging right that everyone is trying to pretend doesn't exist. Not everyone, but lots of people are trying to pretend doesn't exist, um, but clearly does. I mean, see our podcast on the United Nations conspiracy theory, for example. Um, then we would really be happy to hear that. Um, otherwise, yeah, leave a comment, subscribe, share this. Thank you very much. It does seem like exaggerating sexism and racism would actually be causing negative impacts on women and on black people, which is ironic because the people who are doing so are claiming to do so on behalf of those groups and are actually doing them harm. The evidence today was presented for sexism, but we would be surprised if the same wasn't true for race, um, for homosexuality, probably for transgender people as well. Um, and I think I don't want to meet, read your mind here, Elizabeth, but I think we would suggest that um, for any political movement to have a benign influence upon the world, it ought to focus on what unites us as human beings wouldn't rather that be than lovely? what divides us. Because, by the way, what unites us in terms of predicting for behaviors and so on and so forth is far more consequential, Vastly. given that yes. given that we are of the same species. Yes. You have more yes. in common with a female woman than you do a female chimpanzee. And a chimpanzee yes. is actually quite close to you, genetically speaking, let alone a female fire ant, or if there is such a thing. Good. And on that note, thank you very much. Bye bye.